Hey, welcome to Luther Memorial Church. My name is Jesse Lava. I'm Emily Moen, and this is Soren. We're so glad you're joining us today. Um, please have a wonderful worship service with us. We're glad you're here. Hi, I'm Zach Shep. And I'm Connor. And we're your accolades for today's service. Hello, I'm Pastor Lindsay, and I'm very glad to be with you in worship today. However and whenever it is that you are joining us, we are glad to be together. Will you now please join with me as we begin with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us now continue as we confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all of creation. Amen. Please join me. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all that we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. Now, people of God, hear this good news. How vast is God's grace? Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we're forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. One, two, three, four. All the same.
Mark chapter 1, verse 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as having one authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the one, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority, he commands, even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of the Lord. Grace and peace to you today from God our Creator and Jesus our strength. Amen. A few months ago, I had to get a new power cord for my computer. I had to visit the store and it was this whole thing, right, that would have been easy pre-COVID. I had to register online for an appointment, check in with an official when I got there, wait in a line, and I mean, you can probably imagine the whole thing. After about 20 minutes in line, I heard one of the women who was waiting at the window in the front or talking to a salesperson loudly say, I want to speak to a manager. You know when you hear that line, something is not going well. That lady had had it and she wanted someone to come in and fix the problem now. Someone with more power to override the frustrating system. Someone who could make a difference. Someone with more authority. Authority is a complicated word these days, one that can immediately raise the red flag of suspicion. It's not that we don't appreciate authority. No, we certainly do. It's just that it's not hard to think of people in positions of power who have abused their authority, like clergy, people in government, even institutions. I mean, we are conditioned from the time that we are born as babies to depend on adults who are more powerful and more authoritative than us to take care of us. We trust people with power. This is obviously a very simple relationship to authority. And as we grow, hopefully our understanding in relationship to authority deepens. I remember learning how to drive as a teenager with my dad in the passenger seat of the car one afternoon. And I turned onto one of those winding suburban roads in the neighborhood and had like a 25 mile an hour speed limit. It was a beautiful day. There were kids playing in front yards and people rollerblading on the street and I was flying down the road. Slow down, my dad cautioned me. But dad, you drive over the speed limit all the time, I answered him. Now he does have a tendency to push the limit now and again, especially on the highway. Not in a neighborhood, I don't, he replied. It was true. As I began to pay attention in the following days and weeks, he always drove slow in the neighborhoods and in the city. In fact, if a soccer ball came flying into the road, he would actually stop the car right there in the road to make sure that no kid came flying after the soccer ball to get it. His actions lined up with his advice or his instruction to me that day in the car. And after I realized this, I had a deeper respect for his authority. I still drive slow in neighborhoods, even to this day. Our Bible story describes the authority of Jesus over an unclean spirit. In the case of Jesus, his presence in the synagogue in Capernaum and the way that he liberates this man who was possessed by this unclean spirit, it hit the people in the congregation there with this hard sense of truth and authority that they were not used to experiencing from their leaders. What Jesus said matched up with what he did. Wow, this guy is the real deal. Jesus doesn't use any gimmicks or slick language in this exorcism. He rebukes this spirit and tells it to come out. What happens next there in the synagogue isn't necessarily pretty. It certainly wasn't comfortable to watch, I'm sure, for the people who were there. There were convulsions, there was yelling. Someone probably would have called an ambulance had it been in today's day and age. But the man is liberated or healed, and scripture says that the people were amazed. 
Now with this Bible story, I'm just gonna get the obvious out of the way and say that I don't know exactly what the unclean spirit is that Mark is talking about. Some folks have said that it was an actual evil spirit, like a demon that had its clutches in this person's soul. Maybe. Some say that this man was suffering from some sort of physical or mental condition that the ancient world might have referred to as an unclean spirit. Could be. Whatever it was, it was something that sucked the life out of this man. And when I look at it like that, being possessed by something that sucks the life out of you it doesn't seem like a weird or ancient thing. It's even something that I could say I've actually experienced. For example, I've been possessed in my life by anger or resentment over any number of things. The state of the world, feeling mad at someone, fixating on some small incident, incident that happened, or feeling misunderstood, you name it. I have been possessed by a jealousy or an envy that has led me to be less generous with my resources. And that's just the beginning, right? I mean, we get this story because it's ours, right? We get what it is to be consumed by death dealing forces that prevent us from living the full life that God wants us to live. Death dealing forces are these things that isolate us and compromise our dignity and can be hard sometimes to control. Some of us, for example, are obsessed with how right we are or how wrong the other group or person is. Some of us ruthlessly compare ourselves to others and are racked with jealousy. There are those of us that suffer with depression and anxiety. There are those of us who are addicted to alcohol, to perfection, our work, addicted to thinness. Some of us cannot get over setbacks, failures, and mistakes in our lives. I would also say that there are death dealing forces like white supremacy and racism that subtly shape shift over time. Whether we like it or not, we are all complicit. We're also complicit in the climate crisis and we are completely caught up with that whether or not we want to be. We may not call these things demons, but we would no doubt call them demonic. They are everything that conspire to keep us dead when God wants us alive. They move subtly and cunningly in the world and they resist our best intentions to vanquish them. And as we try to get a hold of them, it can be like wrestling a sort of beast. Jesus' mission is to destroy all of these things that keep us from God and suck the life out of us. Like these personal heartbreaks that I mentioned or these shape-shifting systems built on suffering and oppression or this pandemic. That is no small mission. The power of God is no small power. Now there is power and authority in honestly naming those death-defying forces that try to shape our lives, right? Jesus looked clear-eyed at that man who was in agony. Jesus saw it all. He didn't ask somebody to walk the guy out or turn away from him and look the other direction. I think of authority in the voice like that of our youth poet laureate, Amanda Gorman, when she called us to be brave enough to see. Brave enough to see those forces that squeeze the life out of us as a society, to step out of the shade of flame and unafraid, she said. She poetically named the things that possess and bind us and she named them on purpose. It wasn't just once upon a time that Jesus walked the earth to vanquish these things that bind us and possess us. In the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus is baptized, the story tells us that God's Holy Spirit descends into him. Now, this is no pretty dove that like gracefully lands on Jesus' shoulder there in the Jordan River. God's Holy Spirit descends into Jesus and possesses him. Jesus is emboldened by the Holy Spirit and possessed. And he defies these forces of evil that ruin us and trap us. He is the liberator, the demon slayer, the all-powerful, the Christ. When Jesus speaks, we hear God's voice. When Jesus acts, we see God's hand. And that's not all. 
You see, we too are impassioned and emboldened and possessed by God's Holy Spirit. And this presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives gives us the power to confront the brokenness. The Salt Blog wrote this week that when Jesus says to James and John, follow me, like we heard about last week when Pastor Kevin preached, he means to follow him into the fray, into the shadows, into the menace itself. He means follow him into the work of building up from the ruins, of freeing the captives. And by the power and authority of the Holy Spirit, we do. Another line of that poem that Amanda Gorman wrote, reads, the new dawn blooms as we free it. Sometimes the story of Jesus' transform transformative power is as dramatic as it was in our Bible story that we heard today. There are plenty of people in this world who've had these dramatic encounters with grace and mercy and, and can share their stories with us about them. And then sometimes this road that leads to restoration and healing is a slow journey. It takes time and companionship. It means sharing a part of your story or participating in a small group. It means asking well-timed questions and listening carefully. It means maybe for somebody joining an anger management class or offering support to someone or reaching out to a prayer chain or a parenting group or a friend or whoever it might be. All of these are ways that this power of God works on us slowly and persistently in order to free us. In the Bible story, the people, after this man is liberated, the people are amazed and astonished with what Jesus has done. We too are called to be amazed and astonished. And then there is something that calls in us the power to be brave enough to work to vanquish those death-dealing forces that bind those of us, or those that are around us. As Amanda Gorman so eloquently said, for there is always light, if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. Blessed be the journey. Amen.
us offer to God both our praises and petitions for all those in need. Responding to each prayer with the words, your mercy is great. Faithful God, we praise you for sustaining the church during this difficult time. We pray that you give to all preachers and teachers the power of your prophetic spirit, that their words will proclaim the comfort and challenge of Christ. Be to yourself all those who have become captive to false prophets and empty promises. Free them and embrace them in your mercy. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Bountiful God, we praise you for continuously creating the earth and nourishing its creatures. We pray that you restore lands and waters that have been harmed by human misuse. Raise up advocates for an ecological way of life and guide us towards an appropriate use of government and preserving the earth's natural resources. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Compassionate God, we praise you for each day of health and well-being, and we pray for all those who are sick and suffering. Comfort those with mental illness or emotional distress, those institutionalized or living on the streets or residing in our homes. We praise you for the development of COVID-19 vaccines, and we pray for their fair and prompt distribution. Increase in our land a commitment to limit contagion to others. Visit all who have contracted the coronavirus and all who are experiencing the long-term effects of COVID-19. Strengthen medical workers and home health aides. Receive our prayers for those we name before you in our hearts. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Reconciling God, we praise you for your spirit of wisdom and concord. We pray for all those who make decisions whether in homes, churches, or in societies. Keep families from quarreling over which foods to eat. Instruct us when to preserve the past and when to institute change, when to maintain our own preferences and when to yield to others. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Gracious God, we give you praise for your continuous untold blessings, and we offer you now the petitions of our own hearts. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Eternal God, we praise you for your servants of time past, whose words and actions have inspired our lives. We mourn those who have died of COVID-19. Unite us with all our beloved dead, now through our memories and at the end of time in your presence. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Into your hands, merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your loving care, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Hi, my name is Hunter. And I am Maddox. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. It is so good to see everyone. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with all of you. Have a great weekend, everyone. We give you thanks for your offering today. In faith, we share all of who we are and all that we have with God and with one another. We're so great, very grateful for the way that you share your gifts and your resources with LMC. After this week's Sunday worship, and I realize some of you might be watching this later in the week, but after worship on Sunday, we'll host our annual meeting and we'll wrap up our pledge drive with that meeting. We uh, depend on your giving, and when you pledge, it helps us to know that we can count on your financial support for this year going forward. So I'm really grateful to those of you who have pledged, and if you haven't you can, and you'd like to, you can head to our website to the Give tab, and there is a button where you can pledge electronically. It's very easy, so we'd invite you to consider that. For the many ways that you serve God and one another, we are so very grateful. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds for communion. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We come to this table together in communion, and we rest together for a moment in God's presence. 
We're connected by this worship service that we watch across space and time, and we are connected by this communion table here and now. Shortly after Jesus was anointed, he took bread, he blessed it and he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to all to drink, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. After they heard those words, Jesus' disciples then shared in that meal together around that table. Over the days and years before them, they would return to that meal and they would remember Jesus' presence with them as they ate that bread and drank that cup. And today we do the same. As we share together in this meal, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The table of God is ready. It is a table where all are welcome, along with our stories, our joys, our struggles, and our griefs. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Please come. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ may strengthen you and give you courage and faith as you go from this worship today. Now receive this blessing. Love sends us in our full humanity to encounter the full humanity of others, messy, real, and complicated as it is. As you leave this place, may compassion be our practice. May differences be our teacher. May honesty and truth guide us. May you remember that God calls not the perfect, but the willing. With the, assurance with the assurance of the Spirit's companionship, go now in peace. Amen.
name is Nathan Byerly. Hello, it's Ruby Byerly. My name is Jacob Byerly. Have a wonderful and glorious weekend. Go, peace. Service the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.